With the taste of triumph in the Battle of Plassey in 1757, the British East India Company set its sights on even greater conquests. The Marathas, a mighty empire in western India, were the next challenge. Engaging in a series of fierce battles, the British gradually prevailed, expanding their territorial reach and influence. Before I proceed, I want to thank you all for the 50 subs. And if you are new to the channel, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could support me by subscribing to my channel. Thank you, and now let's continue. Venturing further south, they encountered the courageous Sultan of Mysore, Tipu Sultan, who fiercely defended his realm. Undeterred, the British engaged in a protracted struggle, ultimately leading to the annexation of Mysore in 1799. Yet, the spirit of resistance persisted. The Sikhs of the Punjab, known for their valor and tenacity, faced the might of the British East Indian Army, which included many Indian soldiers fiercely loyal to their British commanders. The clash of cultures and ideologies created a tapestry of history woven with the threads of ambition and destiny. But it was not just the sword that expanded British influence, diplomacy and guile played equally important roles. The subsidiary alliance system was conceived, compelling Indian princely states to accept British protection. Through this arrangement, the states found themselves under the watchful eye of the British, becoming increasingly dependent on their protectors. In addition, the doctrine of lapse was introduced, a treacherous policy allowing the British to seize Indian states without direct heirs, further swelling their dominion. Thus, through a web of alliances and political maneuvering, the British extended their reach without always assuming direct governance. Economic acumen also served as a potent tool. Monopolies on certain goods, raised tariffs, and exclusive trading rights helped the British tighten their grip on India's resources, though the impact on the local economy was not without controversy. Seeking to cement their rule, the British introduced administrative reforms. They appointed British officials to govern provinces, establishing a centralized administrative system mirroring their own homeland. This restructuring of governance left an indelible mark on the subcontinent. Beyond the realm of politics and economics, the British also aimed to reshape Indian society and culture. They disseminated Indian language, education system, and cultural norms, leaving a lasting imprint on the minds of the Indian populace. Yet, amidst the sweeping changes and seemingly invincible British rule, discontent simmered beneath the surface. The soul of India yearned for its own voice and identity, and the storm of rebellion began to brew. In the year 1857, the land erupted in the flames of the Indian Rebellion. This historic uprising, also known as the First War of Independence or the Sepoy Mutiny, shook the very foundations of British rule. Though the rebellion was ultimately suppressed, it left an indelible mark on both British and Indian history. In the year 1857, a storm was brewing in India, hidden beneath the surface of apparent calm. For decades, the Indian sepoys, serving in the British East India Company's army, had been silently bearing the weight of multiple grievances, each one becoming a thread that would ultimately weave the tapestry of a great revolt against their British masters. One of the most inflammatory threads in this tapestry was the usage of cartridges that allegedly contained cow and pig fat. This grievance played a crucial role in the outbreak of the Sepoy Mutiny as it deeply offended the religious beliefs and sentiments of both Hindu and Muslim Sepoys. The British had introduced a new infield rifle that required the Sepoys to bite off the tips of paper cartridges before loading them into their rifles. These cartridges were coated with grease to ease loading, and it was widely rumored that the grease used was a mixture of cow fat and pig fat. For Hindus, the cow is a sacred animal, 
and its slaughter and consumption are strictly forbidden. Similarly, in Islam, pigs are considered unclean animals, and their consumption is prohibited. The use of such cartridges was seen as a direct assault on the religious beliefs and sentiments of both Hindu and Muslim sepoys. The outrage and fear among the sepoys were palpable. They believed that the British were deliberately trying to undermine their religious practices and force them to violate their sacred beliefs. As the news of the greased cartridges spread through the ranks, so did the fear that the British were conspiring to convert them to Christianity, further fanning the flames of discontent. Amidst this religious turmoil, other grievances were not forgotten. Military grievances, economic exploitation, princely states concerns, cultural and religious issues, social and cultural changes, discontent among sepoys leaders, and perception of threats to religion, all these threads were tightly woven into the fabric of discontent. The burden of military grievances weighed heavily on the sepoys. The British implemented reforms in the Bengal army that left them discontented. They were stripped of allowances and privileges, and the British demanded that they serve overseas, which contradicted their religious beliefs. This enforced service beyond the seas sowed the seeds of resentment. Another grievance lay in the discriminatory practices prevalent within the military. Despite their skills and experience, Indian sepoys were denied promotions to higher ranks. The British officers reserved these positions for themselves, establishing a racial hierarchy that favored the British soldiers. The lack of promotion opportunities and limited upward mobility further fueled their discontent. But military grievances were not the only concern. The economic exploitation of the Indian populace by the British was another thread that contributed to the rebellion. Heavy land taxes were imposed on farmers, leaving them impoverished and heavily indebted. The annexation of prosperous kingdoms like Jhansi and Nagpur under the doctrine of lapse brought economic hardships and loss of autonomy to their people. The British's imposition of heavy indirect taxes on goods and activities, along with the destruction of Indian industries in favor of British goods, added to the people's distress. Skilled artisans and workers found themselves unemployed and economically vulnerable, witnessing their traditional way of life slipping away. The discontent was not confined to the common people alone. The princely states, with their rich history and traditions, also faced the wrath of British expansion. The annexation of states like Sitara, Jaipur, and Samhalpur under the doctrine of lapse left the local nobility and the people seething with resentment. Cultural and religious concerns were yet another thread in this grand revolt. Attempts to abolish widow remarriage, censorship on the Indian press, and British missionary activities aimed at converting Indians to Christianity were met with resistance from those who wished to preserve their cultural practices and religious beliefs. As the British further influenced Indian society with the introduction of railways and Western education, a division emerged between those who embraced Westernization and those who held fast to traditional customs and practices. Traditional occupations suffered due to the promotion of modern industries, leading to economic dislocation and dissatisfaction. The discontent was also fueled by the treatment of Indian officers within the British-controlled military. Discrimination, erosion of respect, isolation from British officers, and harsh punishments for minor offenses left the native officers disillusioned and angered. Moreover, the perception of threats to religion added another layer of unrest. Rumors of cow slaughter, forced conversions, and British efforts to undermine traditional beliefs created an atmosphere of fear and resistance among the Indian population. Amidst all these simmering grievances, the immediate triggers that sparked the explosion were not far behind. The Merit Uprising, the revolt in Barakpur, and discontent in Burhampur and Kanpur were the catalysts that set the rebellion in motion. 
The Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 was not merely a random outburst of violence, but a culmination of years of discontent and exploitation. The threads of military grievances, economic exploitation, princely states' concerns, cultural and religious issues, social and cultural changes, discontent among Sepoy's leaders, perception of threats to religion, and the immediate triggers wove together to create a tapestry of rebellion that shook the very foundations of British rule in India. This uprising would forever change the course of India's struggle for independence. In the days leading up to the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857, a young Sepoy named Mondal Pandey, stationed at the Barakpur military garrison near Calcutta, found himself embroiled in a volatile situation. The simmering discontent among the Indian soldiers was fueled by the actions of the East India Company. On March 29, 1857, at the parade ground, Mondal Pandey, now 29 years old and a member of the 34th BNI, declared his rebellion against the British officers. His anger escalated to violence when he shot at Sergeant Major James Hewson, who had come to investigate Pondé's behavior. The unrest caught the attention of Lieutenant Henry Baugh, who was also targeted by Pondé's gunfire. However, Pondé's actions failed to inspire an immediate revolt among his comrades. General John Hearsey, upon arriving at the scene, witnessed Pandey seemingly caught in a religious frenzy. Ordered to arrest Mongol Pandey, Jiminarishri Prasad, an Indian commander of the quarter guard, refused to take action. The other sepoys present hesitated to restrain Pandey, except for a soldier named Sheikh Paltu, who managed to prevent him from continuing the attack. Facing a lack of support from his fellow soldiers, Mongol Pandey attempted to take his own life by turning the musket on himself. Although he survived the self-inflicted wound, he was promptly court-martialed and ultimately hanged on April 8, 1857. In the aftermath of Pandey's actions, Jaminarishri Prasad was sentenced to death and executed on April 21. The 34th Bengal Native Infantry Regiment, considered to harbor ill feelings towards its superiors, was disbanded and stripped of its uniforms, leading to further resentment among the sepoy ranks. These harsh punishments and the disgraceful disbanding of the regiment served as a catalyst for the growing rebellion. Disgruntled ex-sepoys, driven by a thirst for revenge, returned home to Awad, setting the stage for a widespread and violent uprising that would soon engulf northern India. During mid-April, simmering discontent fanned the flames of unrest in military cantonments across the land. A significant episode unfolded at Umbala, a sprawling cantonment where General Anson, the commander-in-chief of the Bengal army, apprehensively sensed an imminent rebellion over the contentious issue of the Enfield rifle cartridges. Despite objections, he reluctantly postponed the musketry practice but failed to issue a decisive order to prevent trouble. The unrest spilled beyond Umbala's borders, with incidents of arson and chaos erupting in Agra, Allahabad, and Umbala. Barak buildings went up in flames, and British officers' bungalows were targeted, casting a dark shadow over the land. In the heart of Merit, Another military cantonment held a significant concentration of both Indian and British troops. Here, Lieutenant Colonel George Carmichael Smith's uncompromising orders to the 3rd Bengal Light Cavalry set the stage for further turmoil. On April 24, 90 soldiers paraded for firing drills, but a shocking majority refused to accept their cartridges. A court-martial followed, and 85 soldiers were sentenced to hard labor and imprisonment. The condemned men were paraded and stripped of their uniforms before being led away to jail. Their fate ignited fury among their comrades, who felt betrayed by the lack of support. Sunday dawned, and off-duty British officers prepared for church services while their fellow soldiers sought relaxation in canteens and the bustling Merit Bazaar. 
Seething anger and resentment loomed over the Indian troops, especially the 3rd Cavalry, who saw an opportunity to act. In a swift and shocking turn of events, the Indian troops broke into open rebellion. Junior British officers who tried to quell the first outbursts met a grim fate at the hands of the rebels. British officers' quarters became the target of the sepoys' fury, and civilians tragically paid the price. As unrest spread like wildfire, some sepoys from the 11th Bengal Native Infantry ensured the safety of trusted British officers and their families before joining the rebellion. The situation spiraled out of control, compelling the rebels to make their way to Delhi, the ancient capital and home of the Mughal Emperor, Bahadur Shah II. On May 11, 1857, the rebel sepoys arrived in Delhi and gathered outside the king's palace, urging Bahadur Shah to support and lead their cause. Initially viewing them as mere petitioners, the king's uncertainty allowed more people from the palace to join the uprising. As the rebellion escalated, some regiments stationed near Delhi quickly joined the sepoys' ranks, while others hesitated but refused to act against their comrades. In a desperate bid to prevent the arsenal from falling into rebel hands, British ordnance officers resorted to drastic measures, leading to a violent explosion that shook the city. The news of these events reached the sepoys stationed around Delhi, finally pushing them into open rebellion. Salvaging arms from the arsenal, they prepared for a prolonged struggle. Inside the palace, Bahadur Shah II faced a defining moment as the sepoys' demands grew more insistent. Eventually, he relented and accepted their allegiance, reluctantly becoming a symbol of the rebellion. Mid-May witnessed a grim escalation, as many British prisoners met a brutal fate under the people tree outside the palace. The Sepoy Mutiny had spiraled into a full-fledged uprising, and the once unstoppable British East India Company found itself grappling with a formidable and widespread challenge to its authority in the heart of India. The British were not prepared as the mutiny erupted, and they struggled to respond swiftly. Troops stationed in Britain had to embark on lengthy sea voyages to reach India, while others journeyed overland through Persia from the Crimean War. Some regiments, originally en route to China, were redirected to bolster the British presence in India. As the British organized their troops within India into field forces, two columns set out from Merit and Simla. Slowly but resolutely, they advanced towards the heart of the rebellion, encountering resistance at every step. Along the way, they dealt with the rebels harshly, executing and hanging numerous Indians who dared to challenge their authority. Two months after the initial outbreak of the mutiny in Merit, the two British forces converged near Colonel. Joined by two Gurkha units from the Bengal army, who were contracted soldiers from the Kingdom of Nepal, the combined force confronted the main rebel army at Badli Kusarai. In fierce combat, they managed to drive the rebels back towards Delhi. The company's army, now gaining momentum, established a base on the Delhi Ridge to the north of the city, and thus began the siege of Delhi. This protracted siege endured from July 1st to September 21st, during which the British forces faced significant challenges. The encirclement of Delhi was not entirely secure, and the rebels received resources and reinforcements with relative ease, often making it seem as though the besieging British forces were the ones under siege. Disease, exhaustion, and continuous sorties by the rebels threatened to force the besiegers to withdraw. However, thanks to the timely suppression of rebellions in the Punjab and the reinforcement of the British, Sikh, and Pakhtun soldiers under the command of John Nicholson, the besieging forces held their ground. The rebels, sensing the tides turning against them, offered terms for surrender on August 30th, but the British refused to negotiate. Instead, an eagerly awaited heavy siege train joined the besieging force, bolstering their offensive capabilities. From September 7th, 
The siege guns relentlessly battered the city's walls and silenced the rebels' artillery. A daring attempt to storm the city through the breach walls and the Kashmiri Gate was launched on September 14. The British managed to gain a foothold within the city but suffered heavy casualties. Despite this setback, the British officers were resolute in their determination to press on. Following a grueling week of intense street fighting, the British finally reached the imposing Red Fort. The once mighty Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar had already fled to seek refuge at Humayun's tomb. With the capture of the Red Fort, the British regained control of Delhi. As victory was achieved, the victorious British troops turned their attention to the city itself. There were instances of looting and pillaging. The neighborhood suffered bombardments, leaving countless homes, including those of the noble Muslim families, in ruins. Amidst the chaos, the British authorities apprehended Bahadur Shah Zafar, the symbolic figurehead of the rebellion. The very next day, in an act of ruthless authority, William Hodson, a British agent, took it upon himself to execute Zafar's sons and grandson at the Kuni Darwaza, the bloody gate near Delhi Gate. The news struck the aging emperor with a sense of shocked silence, while Zafar's wife, Zinat Mahal, found grim comfort in the belief that her son would now be Zafar's heir. With Delhi under British control, the British forces wasted no time in their pursuit of suppressing other rebellions at places like Kanpur where the sepoys, led by General Wheeler in Kanpur, now Kanpur, rebelled and laid siege to the British entrenchment. General Wheeler was married to an Indian woman and had relied on his personal prestige and friendly relations with Nana Sahib to prevent rebellion. However, he had taken few measures to fortify the entrenchment or stock up on supplies and ammunition. The besieged British forces endured three grueling weeks under the siege of Kanpur, facing severe shortages of water and food. Men, women, and children suffered continuous casualties. On June 25, Nana Sahib offered them safe passage to Allahabad. With just three days' worth of food remaining, the British accepted the offer on the condition that they could retain their small arms and evacuate in daylight on the morning of the 27th. Early on the morning of June 27, the British party left their entrenchment and made their way to the river, where boats provided by Nana Sahib awaited to take them to Allahabad. However, tragedy struck as chaos erupted among the boatmen, and the situation quickly spiraled out of control. Several sepoys, who had remained loyal to the company, were killed by the rebels, possibly for their loyalty or conversion to Christianity. The boats carrying the British party became the scene of a dreadful massacre. Firing broke out from both banks of the Ganges, where sepoys were strategically positioned with clear lines of fire. The boats were abandoned by their crew and set on fire, leaving many stranded and vulnerable. The survivors were rounded up, and the men were shot. Only four men managed to escape from Kanpur on one of the boats. The surviving women and children were taken captive and held hostage by Nana Sahib. Confined first in Savada Kothi and then in the Bibigar, they endured terrible conditions and losses due to disease. With the arrival of British relief force from Allahabad, Nana Sahib and other leading rebels decided that the hostages must be killed to prevent them from being used as bargaining chips. Two Muslim butchers, two Hindu peasants, and one of Nana Sahib's bodyguards were sent to carry out the gruesome act. Armed with knives and hatchets, they killed the women and children. Historians have offered various explanations for this horrific act. Some suggest it was done to undermine Nana Sahib's relationship with the British or to prevent information leaks after Kanpur's fall. Others theorize it was a desperate attempt to avoid recognition by any surviving prisoners who might have witnessed the earlier firings. The massacre at Kanpur deeply affected British attitudes toward the sepoys and intensified their resolve to quell the rebellion. Shortly after the events in Merit, 
rebellion erupted in the state of Awad, a region that had been annexed by the British just a year prior. Henry Lawrence, the British commissioner resident at Lucknow, managed to fortify his position inside the residency compound. With loyal sepoys and other defenders, their numbers amounted to about 1,700 men. The rebels attempted to breach the defenses with explosives and underground tunnels, subjecting the compound to relentless artillery and musket fire. During the siege, Henry Lawrence was one of the casualties, and John Erdley Inglis took over his position. The situation grew dire, and after 90 days of siege, the defenders were reduced to a mere 300 loyal sepoys, 350 British soldiers, and 550 non-combatants. In September, a relief column led by Henry Havelock, accompanied by James Avram, made its way from Kanpur to Lucknow. This became known as the First Relief of Lucknow. Although the column succeeded in defeating rebel forces in several battles, they were not strong enough to break the siege completely. Consequently, they were forced to join the garrison. Later, in October, a larger army under Colin Campbell, the new commander-in-chief, was finally able to relieve the garrison entirely. The defenders, including women and children, were evacuated from the city. They withdrew to Allenbeck, where they constructed a fort and then to Kanpur, where they defeated an attempt to recapture the city. In March 1858, Campbell launched a major offensive on Lucknow, seeking to suppress the rebellion in Awad. He was joined by a large Nepalese contingent advancing from the north. General Dershams Herkumwarana, the youngest brother of Yung Bahadur, also led Nepalese forces in various parts of India. Campbell's progress was slow and cautious, and although he drove the rebel army out of Lucknow, many rebels dispersed into Awad, leading to a prolonged period of dealing with scattered resistance. In Jhansi, a princely state in Bundelkhand, the Rani of Jhansi, Rani Lakshmi Bai, fiercely protested against the annexation of her state to the British Raj. When war erupted, Jhansi became a center of rebellion. A small group of company officials and their families sought refuge in Jhansi Fort, and the Rani negotiated their evacuation. Tragically, they were massacred by uncontrollable rebels upon leaving the fort, leading to suspicion of the Rani's involvement. As the company lost control of much of Budalkan and eastern Rajasthan, the region became mired in conflict, with various princely states warring amongst themselves. Rani Lakshmi by led the successful defense of Jhansi against invading armies. Despite her valor, she was eventually forced to flee, leading to a series of battles in which she fought fiercely against the British forces. In March, the Central India Field Force, led by Sir Hugh Rose, advanced and laid siege to Jhansi. Though the British company forces captured the city, the Rani managed to escape in disguise. Faced with setbacks, the Rani and her group of Maratha rebels captured the fortress city of Gwalior from British allies. However, the Central India Field Force quickly moved against Gwalior, and after intense fighting, the Rani died during the Battle of Gwalior. The company forces recaptured Gwalior shortly thereafter. Colonel Henry Marion Durand, who was serving as the company resident at Indore, initially dismissed the possibility of an uprising in Indore. However, on July 1st, the sepoys in Holkar's army revolted and attacked the Bhopal contingent's cavalry pickets, leading to chaos and loss of control. When Colonel Travers attempted to charge the rebels, the Bhopal cavalry refused to follow, and the Bhopal infantry turned their guns against British sergeants and officers. With no viable means of mounting an effective defense, Colonel Durand made the difficult decision to gather all the British residents and escape, but 39 British residents of Indore lost their lives during the turmoil. In Bihar, the rebellion was concentrated mainly in the western regions of the state, with some outbreaks of plundering and looting in Gaia district. Kumar Singh, 
an 80-year-old Rajput Zamindar of Jagdispur, emerged as a central figure and assumed the leadership of the revolt in Bihar. He was supported by his brother Babu Amar Singh and his commander-in-chief Hare Krishna Singh. The mutiny erupted in the garrisons of Dunapur on July 25th, and the mutineers, along with Kumar Singh and his forces, headed towards Ara. In Ara, British residents sought refuge at Mr. Boyle's house, and a siege ensued. Despite being outnumbered, 18 civilians and 50 loyal sepoys from the Bengal Military Police Battalion, under the command of Herwald Wake, defended the house against artillery and musket fire from an estimated 2,000 to 300 mutineers and rebels. On July 29th, an attempt to relieve Ara from Dunapur failed, and it was not until Major Vincent Eyre arrived with his troops that the siege was lifted. Major Eyre and his forces defeated the rebels and successfully ended the siege on August 3rd. After receiving reinforcements, Major Eyre pursued Kumar Singh to his palace in Jagdispur, but the Rani had already left by the time the British forces arrived. In the Punjab, which included the present-day Indian and Pakistani Punjabi regions and the northwest frontier districts bordering Afghanistan, the rebellion was limited to disjointed uprisings by isolated regiments of sepoys. Some garrisons, like Farazapur, fell to indecision on the part of senior British officers, allowing the sepoys to rebel and then leave the area to head for Delhi. However, at Peshwar, the British took decisive action intercepting sepoys mail to prevent coordination of an uprising and swiftly disarming the most disaffected Bengal native regiments. The Punjab region had been less sympathetic to the sepoys compared to other parts of India, and many local chieftains sided with the British. The region also saw the recruitment of irregular units from Sikh and Pakhtun communities to support the British. Other regions like Orissa and Gujarat experienced sustained rebellions by local leaders, landowners, and armed communities, unlike the mutiny by sepoys in other parts of North India. In Gujarat, landowners and armed communities opposed the British due to the Anam Commission, leading to a sustained rebellion in the region. Throughout these regions, the rebellion caused significant turmoil and loss of life, as the British authorities faced resistance from various sections of the population. The rebellion and its suppression were marked by acts of courage and tragedy on both sides, leading a lasting impact on India's history. Despite its initial momentum and widespread nature, the rebellion ultimately failed to achieve its objectives. Several key factors contributed to the failure of the rebellion. The rebellion had a limited scope, with its main focus being the Dobe region, the fertile plain between the Ganges and Yamuna rivers. While it garnered substantial support in some areas, a significant part of the country remained unaffected by the revolt. This lack of a united front weakened the overall impact of the rebellion, and the British were able to maintain control over various regions. One of the critical factors that hindered the success of the rebellion was the lack of effective leadership. Although there were brave leaders like Nana Saheb, Tantia Tope, and Rani Lakshmi Bai, they struggled to offer cohesive and strategic leadership to unite and guide the movement as a whole. The absence of a central leadership structure made coordination and decision-making difficult, leading to a fragmented resistance. Moreover, the rebels faced severe challenges in terms of resources. They lacked sufficient men, money, and weaponry to sustain a prolonged confrontation with the well-equipped and well-financed British forces. In contrast, the British received continuous support from their home country, enabling them to maintain a steady supply of reinforcements, funds, and arms in India. The rebellion also suffered due to the non-participation of certain influential quarters in Indian society. The English-educated middle class, along with wealthy merchants, traders, and zamindars in Bengal, chose not to support the uprising. Instead, 
they actively assisted the British in suppressing the rebellion. This lack of support from influential sections of society weakened the rebels' position and bolstered the British cause. Furthermore, the British military had a significant advantage in terms of organization, discipline, and access to modern weaponry. They possessed a well-trained and powerful force, supported by efficient communication networks. This superiority gave the British a considerable edge over the rebel forces and made it challenging for the rebellion to sustain a prolonged conflict. The British response to the rebellion was ruthless and brutal. In the face of the uprising, they unleashed a wave of atrocities and retributions against the rebels and the civilian population. This ruthless approach further discouraged potential supporters from joining the rebellion and created an atmosphere of fear and submission. As the rebellion was suppressed, the British took decisive action to reassert their control over India. The British Crown took direct control from the East India Company and India's governance underwent significant changes. The events of 1857 paved the way for a more direct and centralized form of colonial rule in India, which continued until India gained its independence in 1947. Despite its failure, the rebellion served as a crucial turning point in India's history, leading to significant changes in its governance and setting the stage for future movements towards independence. In the aftermath of the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857, India lay in a state of devastation and despair. The rebellion had witnessed atrocities committed by both sides, leading to a staggering loss of life. In Out Alone, some estimates put the toll at 150,000 Indians killed during the war, with 100,000 of them being civilians. The capture of Delhi, Allahabad, Kanpur, and Lucknow by British forces were followed by general massacres. One of the most notorious incidents was the massacre carried out by General Neal, who executed thousands of Indian mutineers and civilians suspected of supporting the rebellion. The British, in turn, responded with severe retribution, adopting brutal punishments like hanging mutineers and blowing them from cannons. In the face of British military superiority and ruthless response, the rebels struggled to sustain the uprising. By the end of 1857, the British had begun to gain ground again. Lucknow was retaken in March 1858, and on July 8, 1858, a peace treaty was signed, officially marking the end of the rebellion. The last rebels were defeated in Gwalior on June 20, 1858, and by 1859, prominent rebel leaders like Bakit Khan and Nana Sahib had either been killed or had fled. The aftermath of the rebellion saw significant changes in India's governance. The British East India Company's rule in India came to an end, and its ruling powers were transferred to the British Crown. The new British Raj established a centralized administration, with the Secretary of State for India formulating Indian policy and the Governor-General of India taking on the title of Viceroy. Some territories that were previously under the East India Company became colonies in their own right. The British colonial administration embarked on a program of reform, trying to integrate Indian higher castes and rulers into the government and abolishing previous attempts at westernization. The British aimed to address the grievances that had contributed to the rebellion, such as religious interference and economic challenges faced by the peasantry. Indians were also gradually drawn into government at a local level, and efforts were made to provide education and opportunities for advancement. However, the reorganization of the military was also a significant outcome of the rebellion. The Bengal army, which had dominated the Indian army before the mutiny, underwent changes. The old Bengal army almost vanished from the order of battle, and new units were recruited from different castes and martial races like the Sikhs and Gurkhas. The inefficiencies of the old organization, 
which had contributed to the estrangement between sepoys and British officers, were addressed with the formation of new units organized on their regular system, fostering a closer bond between officers and soldiers. The aftermath of the rebellion left scars that would take years to heal. The horrors of the mutiny and the atrocities committed on both sides had a profound impact on the relationship between the British rulers and the Indian population. The memory of the rebellion continued to shape British policies and attitudes towards India for decades to come. Ultimately, the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 served as a turning point in India's history, leading to significant changes in its governance, military structure, and social dynamics. The rebellion, although unsuccessful, laid the groundwork for future movements towards independence and instilled a sense of nationalism and unity among the Indian population, setting the stage for the eventual struggle for freedom from British rule. That's all for today. I hope you liked this video and if you did, please give it a thumbs up, share with your friends and if you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments section. Thank you, and have a great day ahead.